This is Yoga Girl underscore Ritika on Instagram Live on this episode of Yogis That Inspire. And it's an honor for me to introduce you um, to Marilyn Henry. Um, Marilyn was one of my main yoga teachers at my 300 hour yoga teacher training with Kaya. And she's also the founder and lead yoga teacher of Zaz Yoga, yoga school. So Marilyn has a PhD in osteopathy. She's a Reiki master and a mindfulness coach. Not to mention all of this after she left her corporate world as a project manager and event coordinator for big brands like Emirates and Hewitt Packard. Um, And with all this wealth of knowledge under her belt, she used her prior experience in the corporate world to teach corporate yoga and yoga for depression, anxiety and stress. So I'm really excited um, to have Marilyn and for you guys to listen in as she talks about yoga philosophy, yoga for depression, about her story, and the goal is to inspire and empower you to be your most authentic and beautiful self in the midst of a perfectly imperfect life. So let me just add Hi! Hello! Welcome back! I'm so happy this <laughs> opportunity to see your beautiful face again. See, you get me twice. How are yes! You? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so, Marilyn, uh, I had lots of time to reflect and ponder on all of the beautiful things you said last time. And I'd like to get some clarity on you know, the key moment in your life where you made that shift in decision and to change your feel completely from the corporate world to yoga, was there a key defining moment for you? Um, there was. It came in several steps, but um, I have to say the key moment was when I was uh, in Bali. I was still in my corporate job and very happy in my corporate job, I must say. I, I loved what I was doing. It was fun. I was traveling a lot, working with multicultural teams. Um, And at the same time, I was teaching yoga a little bit here and there, teaching corporate yoga mainly and yoga for stress, anxiety and depression in private settings. And while I was in Bali for a yoga retreat, I met my yoga anatomy teacher, Rachel, uh, who you know, the anatomy school, if you want to follow her. And so I met Rachel and the way she presented the human body to me was just like it opened a universe that was so incredible. And I met this woman and was like, this is what I want to do with my life. So within the retreat, we had a little break in the afternoon. Right away, I went online. I looked um, at possible programs uh, where I could either deepen my knowledge of anatomy or straight on do an osteopathy program. And the universe just put it on my lap that I found the perfect uh, osteopathy school and decided to actually leave my corporate job, not to teach yoga, but actually to go back to school. Um, and, and this happened as a, a desire to deepen my knowledge of the human body to better serve my students, to better understand the relationship between um, physical pain and emotional pain, how our life experiences Uh, impact us on a deeper level and and sometimes emotional wounds will just present themselves physically later in life so um so yeah i know that many yoga teachers just get tired of their corporate career and and just say like screw that i cannot take it anymore i'll go teach yoga for me that was not the case it was really a desire to learn more um, and by doing that, that gave me more space to spend more of my time teaching, which I now do full time and, and really do what I love while studying what I love. So, so yeah, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> oh, amazing. And, um, how has your, like, since you started studying osteopathy, how has your physical asana practice changed? And doing your PhD so in osteopathy. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm in my last year. It's actually my end of semester. I spend my days like studying all the different types of fractures and it's fascinating. Um, how does that impact my asana practice? So, 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 so much. I have to say I was really lucky. I got trained by fantastic teachers who already had um, a great respect for 
anatomy and, and how the body actually works. But when I practice yoga in studios, very often it was very pushy and very aesthetic in the sense of very specific on the distance between your feet or the angles of your feet or like how the body should look like in a posture. And studying uh, osteopathy to me was really a way to better understand movement and better understand also the anatomical variations that we have. We, like, when we learn things, we tend to simplify them, but the reality is that our skeletons are really complex, our muscles are really complex, and no two bodies are the same. So most people will have 12 pairs of ribs, for example, but some people have 13. Some people will have uh, three vertebrae in their coccyx. Others will have four. How does that impact the way that we move? It does because that's going to impact a range of motion. So it impacted my own practice in the sense that I have tremendous respect now for my own body limits and I don't see them as a failure or I'm not able to do that, but more as embracing the fact that this is how my body is made and better understanding how lifestyle impacts certain muscles and then uh, inhibits certain ones and the compensation patterns. So really this awareness of what's happening in the body. Um, but the biggest impact is really in my teachings where I took out pretty much all aesthetic cues out of my vocabulary. I even stopped saying, for example, um, the big toes together and heels apart in, in Tadasana, right? This is yeah. a cue that we hear all the time. Well, I'm really careful with that cue now because it can bring an internal rotation in the knee. So I'll say big toes together, heels very slightly apart, or just keep your feet so that your knees point forward, um, whatever that yeah. means for you. So... So to me, the, the respect of the uniqueness of our body has been a huge learning. And, and I've had so many students tell me like, why I did not understand why this posture was so painful or why I was starting to develop uh, knee pain when I was practicing. And now I understand. And this is really powerful to, to understand how we work and how we move. <laughs> That is very powerful. And also like the health of the bones itself, the bone density. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That having an impact on people, adjusting people, right? To yoga teachers, adjusting students, not being aware of that they may have a fragile bone density. Correct. <laughs> yeah, especially a well, more and more uh, people of older age now are practicing yoga, which is so fantastic. Um, yeah. But at the same time, as, you, as you're saying, their bone density will not be the same. They may have yeah. underlying um, arthritis that we're not aware of. So it's so important yeah. to understand the biomechanics of the body. Yeah. And um, like, what do you love most about osteopathy? Um, to me, what I love the most, and that's, that's kind of the definition I use when people ask me what is osteopathy, because um, it's not as popular or as known as physiotherapy, is that osteopathy will seek to understand the root cause of a dysfunction. And rather than treating the symptoms, we'll treat the root cause. Um, very often in physio, uh, we will have pain in the knee, we'll treat the knee, right? In osteopathy, uh, not all physio, but more and more these disciplines intertwine. But in osteopathy, when you have knee pain, I'll look at your feet. I'll look at the way you walk. I'll look at your sacral yeah, joint and your spine. I'll look at how you carry. I'll look at how your jaw is because really? your knee pain yeah. could look could, Yeah, a lot of actually a lot wow. of lower back problems and sacrum problems come from the jaw because their body is all interconnected. And to me, the, the aspect of osteopathy of that puzzle of finding the root cause and 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 rather than fixing, addressing the cause so that the problem will not come back rather than fixing a symptoms that will then not fix what creates the symptoms. So the symptom yeah, yeah. comes back. Um, so yeah, it's that interrelation of the body. I also love that osteopathy also um, involves a lot of looking at lifestyle, emotion. Um, yeah, like... It includes a part of the somatic body, so it doesn't mm -hmm. just look at the, the physical muscles and bones, but how our life, how our emotions, how our thoughts can actually 
impact your posture and in turn impact your muscles and bones. Wow, I never expected that. <laughs> <laughs> it is learning fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the somatic body. Oh, it's so interesting how you mentioned that and you learned that in osteopathy. That's been one of my um, recent interests so far, learning to listen to the somatic intelligence that our body innately has. Um, and it's often suppressed. Well, for me anyway, it was suppressed from a young age and only later on now am I tapping into that intelligence that the body is guiding me. Um, yeah. But it's so great that they teach you that in osteopathy. They didn't teach me that in radiography. <laughs> that to me, it was such a beautiful surprise. To, for example, wow. looking at the health of our organs and acknowledge yeah. what Chinese medicine will say, or even Ayurveda will say that that our organs are linked to certain emotion. And you can even bring it back to its anatomical component because I'm not a very woo person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, even though can... you did like Reiki and mindfulness, you're still quite. <laughs> in this I'm very world. rigid you know to yeah. me, I want to understand things so that I can explain them to just about anyone right I, I want to be able to talk to a priest and to talk to a CEO and get them to understand the same things and and to me the answer to that is science um, science allows us to to relate to things that we can see and torture that have been proven with methods that that we acknowledge so um so yeah i, I really love that we can now more and more look at the science of emotion and the biochemical response of the body and how our emotion through the hormones and neurotransmitters will have different impacts and how uh, some fun ones, for example, laughing improves your memory because laughing has an impact on the activation of the cells of the brain. And <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to remember that. So laughing to remember that fact. <laughs> laughing improves your memory that's even the anticipation like you know you're going for a comedy yeah. the anticipation of laughing will release chemicals in the body that will improve the memory so our emotions have an impact physically and it can also have a very negative impact as we know stress uh, has a terrible impact on the body and makes the cells age and die a lot faster so yeah we will live at such a fascinating time where all the woo-woo stuff yeah. is now becoming like researched and proven and, and explained through science. That's so fascinating because, yeah, knowing you, you are quite rigid. You quite have a really um, scientific explanation for everything that you've taught <laughs> in your and which is great. But then what made you learn, this is a bit off topic, but learn Reiki? And oh, God. Yeah, like, <laughs> how did that tie in? And uh, what do you it, think of Reiki? Do you think it's an act, it actually works on the energetic body? Do you believe that? Absolutely. I think that Reiki is a very powerful and effective healing modality. I think that the placebo effect as well um, has an impact. But there's been now um, double-blind studies proving the effect of energy um, healing to, to a certain way. The way I got into that is um, it was just presented to me at the, the perfect timing. My, um, my partner had like some emotional blockage that as a yoga teacher, you know, we sense things from the way people yeah. act or move. So, mm. and I had a bunch of sound, uh, of sound balls. So I said, can I do a little bit of sound healing? So I did a little sound healing with him with one specific bowl that I thought would affect a specific chakra and after that he went into a rage that I've never seen him with so I'm like okay don't mess with stuff you don't understand and the same way one of my girlfriends sent me a message for Reiki certification I'm like you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna try to understand um, how that whole like holistic healing and energy healing works so I got into Reiki with a lot of skepticism I practice again on my partner. He's my favorite guinea pig, and some very yeah. interesting stuff. Happens. Lucky guy. <laughs> no, but he enjoys it, right? Who I'm sure like there'll be a lot of waiting. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't like to have a free Reiki session? But, but with yeah, you, so, you know. 
<laughs> so yeah, through practice, I, I started seeing the effects. I started seeing some really weird things, like for example, having my own intention for a Reiki session, and then the next day, my partner repeating exactly my intention in a sentence when oh. I never shared it. You know, it was like, okay, there's something more to that. So, so that got me to actually start looking into quantum physics and, oh. and look into like the stuff we don't see and understand yeah. just yet. Um, and to the accept unseen that, ex exactly, oh. and to start accepting that science can answer a lot of things, but we're just starting to develop the tools to actually understand a lot of the unseen and the spiritual stuff. Um, so, so I did my full then Reiki certification after that, accepting that I don't understand it fully, but, um, even without the science behind it, there is a felt sensation that there's something beyond the physical body, right? There's, mm -hmm. Um, I do believe there is, some people call it the universal mind, other people call it the field. I do believe that, that our, our thoughts and, and, and our emotions being electrochemical reactions do have an impact on, on our fields. And, and, you know, we can sense sometimes when our hands are closed that there is something that happens between our hands. Um, so I accept that, although I cannot yet explain it. And, and I think that to have this open-mindedness also allows me to be a better yoga teacher because yoga has all of these concepts, for example, of the koshas, that there are four to six layers, depending on, on the lineage, beyond the physical body, right? We have our energy body, our emotional body, we have our um, mental, mental body. body. Yeah. So... I forgot the other two. <laughs> I, forgot, I was actually saying this to someone the other day. I forgot the other two. Spiritual so we have, so we have our, um, five. our physical body. We have yeah. our energy and emotional body, which is the yeah. second. And then we have our... Um, mental body which is kind of our, our rational thought or our um, subjective mind then we have the intellectual body which is our objective mind and finally we have our bliss body which is oh, yes. kind of the, this this feeling of connection and joy that we have when we're in, either in a deep state of meditation or a state of of bliss right so yoga acknowledges that and models it in in these five layers and science hasn't caught up with that yet am i going to not believe in it because science hasn't caught up well no because it helps me understand other things right although it might not be proven scientifically to me it's a, a model that helps me understand the mind-body connection or the, the impact of the practice. That makes sense. Like why you continue to believe in it um, because you can see the effects, even, even if it's not necessarily backed up by science. Exactly. And eventually science will catch up. I'm yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> well, great. Thanks for sharing that that cool insight into Reiki and the five koshas, um, which I should know, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think you're an absolute an anatomical guru and I loved um, you explaining all the bones in our bodies and how they work and their function during our yoga teacher training. And as a radiographer as well, I was really um, amazed at your extent of knowledge on anatomy that I image every day for work <laughs> <laughs> so it's a real compliment me telling you this um, but can you please, um, give us some examples of why people shouldn't listen to their yoga teacher Yes, well, we briefly touched on it um, earlier, right? Seeing With the Tadasana, everyone, yeah. Yeah, everyone has a, a very different um, a very different body and Again, unfortunately, um, actually, I should say, fortunately, about 50, 60 years ago, yoga really exploded and kind of needed to be standardized to supply to the demand for yoga, right? And mm. it's really difficult to teach and train teachers if you start looking at all the subtleties of everything. So, so my belief is that yoga was standardized uh, a few decades ago. And 
and that then carried through through certain lineages of yoga and and ashtanga and vinyasa are part of them but if we also look at hatha hatha teachers will use the same kind of aesthetic cues um your yoga teacher will never feel what you feel in your body right so your yoga teacher can only guide you to a certain point. And to me, we should not listen to a yoga teacher who tells us how the body should be placed. We should listen to a yoga teacher who tells you how the posture should feel. I hope that makes sense. Right? That makes sense. So I, I, can, I can guide someone into moving into a certain way, but once they've reached their movement, I, I personally feel that my role is to let them know what we're seeking, right? Mm. In a mountain pose, we're seeking grounding and stability and to feel that all of our bones are stacked um in in a warrior i want to make sure that my lower back is protected my knee is protected so kind of safety but also what is the sensation i'm seeking right i want to feel that that extension that confidence that grounding um so when we approach postures from that space of function rather than aesthetics I feel that it's so much more empowering for students because if we expect everyone to look the same, that means that some people will be right, some people will be wrong, right? And it's very disempowering. And, and then we get into that mind chatter of, oh, I'm not doing it right. And that's the opposite of, of the goal of yoga. Yoga is about quieting the mind. So, um, so I, I believe and I encourage students to be empowered in their yoga classes. And if a teacher is not providing cues that feel safe in their bodies or that trigger any type of pain and discomfort, find your own version of, of the posture. Find a posture that feels safe and, and empowering. And what is beautiful with, with that approach is that we can then carry it from the mat to outside of the mat because in our life as well, no one is the same, right? And people yeah. can teach you something like very strictly. If it doesn't work for you, why would you do it this way? Right? We're looking for a result, but our way of achieving this result can be very, um, can be very different. So, yeah, I think our, our students should be empowered and should not be afraid to say like, no, this cue doesn't work for me, so I'm going to do it my way and in a way that is safe for my body to reach the same goal. And that's why we have so many variations of the same postures, right? We, yeah. we can adapt any posture. I am a big fan of chair yoga, for example, right? Yeah. Am I doing less of a warrior because I'm, I'm using a chair? Probably not, right? Because then if I can give access to the benefits of the chest expansion and the shoulder strengthening and the rooting in the pelvis to someone who has reduced mobility by using a chair. I mean, it's, it's a winner. <laughs> yeah. And such well said, I guess that when I remember when I first started, I just wanted, I wasn't sure what feeling I was meant to feel, if that makes sense. So I also just kind of, I wasn't sure, is this, am I meant to feel this way? And the more I did, the more I was able to listen to myself and feel like, okay, this feels good. This feels good, but I'm not overdoing it. I'm not mm -hmm. exerting myself. So I can understand how new people can get caught up and just go into the full posture and ignoring their, their, their own somatic intelligence, which is feeding back to them and saying, no, 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 stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And their ego saying, oh, you have to try and copy everyone else in the class, including the teacher. So exactly. really, I, I think that's a great point. Just really listening to your body um, and sensations first before the teacher. That is so under, um, I guess, not as emphasized in practice. I agree. Um, I think it's... Um... It's a shift that I see happening now in yoga of being more functional than aesthetic in, in the practice. And, and that aspect of, of focusing on the sensation or the purpose, purpose is even less um, implemented, I believe. Um, but I, I hope that it's going to become more mainstream. Something that's really funny, like I'm, I'm often told, like oh, the way you teach yoga is not traditional. 
because we think that tradition is the 50 past years where we told people to put their foot at 45 degrees, right? <sighs> but the yoga tradition is a 5,000 years of tradition of connecting with ourselves. So I feel like I'm more traditional when I don't tell people how to place their body. I tell them to tune into what they feel. That's my personal opinion. Oh, that's great. I love that. Focus on sensation and purpose. That's the key point. Yeah. I wrote. Yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. And um, what are your current yoga philosophy inspirations? Because I know you love yoga philosophy. Oh. So what, is, what do you, currently inspires you? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, for me, I always go back to the sutras, right? Um, and because the, sut the sutras to me have the answer to everything in a way that I can very easily relate to. Um, and I have to admit that at the moment, because um, I, I probably almost know the sutras by heart by now, <laughs> I, I've moved like into other direction. I'm focusing more on... On, on yeah the somatic experience and and linking the mind to the body and, and looking at the the subconscious and unconscious maybe in a more modern way rather than um than the philosophical way right so looking at the brainstem and its impact um, so it's been my recent kind of inspiration which is not directly yoga philosophy but very very complementary to apply yoga philosophy with our kind of modern traumas that we carry. Interesting. Ha, ha, can you give us an example? Um, one of the great books that I haven't finished yet that I think everyone should read uh, could be The Untethered Soul, okay. uh, which is a, a life-changing uh, life book. Um, looking at the theories of trauma release from Peter Levine, um yeah things like that like okay. fascinating books about the functioning of the mind which are not looking at it from necessarily psychology but more from um yeah from biology but still with the philosophical aspect of it I love i'll that. send so you a few references okay <laughs> cool i'll add them to the to the uh, comment section on the for underneath the live um, and that's great that you're embodying the, the somatic experience with the philosophy um, that's, that's such a great uh, I didn't expect that actually <laughs> um, and I know we, you taught us the Vijnana yoga practice um, by or it's in Gupta um, now what do you love what drew you to that practice to oh. delve deep into that and make you teach teach me that now, you know, <laughs> that I love it too now. <laughs> mm, um, I love the Vijnana practice uh, so much. For those uh, listening who don't know Vijnana, it's a very, very small lineage of, of yoga um, with not that many teachers. It's not available in all countries, and that was really, really lucky to be trained by uh kind of peters in and um and sunny who you had as a teacher as well yeah who introduced uh, this practice so why i love it well vijnana has um its root in vinyasa right and so arit herself was trained by krishna macharya so so it's still a very flowy and an active practice which Number one, that's kind of that was a criteria for me. I needed an active practice, but compared to uh, the the Ashtanga practice, for example, which which could be a comparison to Vijnana practice, uh, Ashtanga you do the same series every day, right? In Vijnana, yeah, like yeah. in primary, Vijnana, secondary, and yeah. you have a morning and an afternoon practice for every day of the week. And what made me fall in love is that these practices have a purpose, right? What practice do we do on the first day of the week when we come back to the weekend and we've been disconnected and, and partying? We need something really grounding, 
What practice do we do middle or end of the week when we're getting tired and our energy goes down? We need something more energizing. So again, it's about moving with purpose um, that I think Vijnana brings as a style of yoga, which is really, really beautiful. It's also to me a more feminine type of practice um, mm -hmm. compared to the very young masculine um, movement practices that we see in, in most yoga lineages. Um, and by this, I mean that there is so much fluidity and presence and felt sensation in, in the practice, right? Every movement is, is very mindful, is very embodied and, and present. And it's not, again, about how it looks. It's about becoming uh, the movement. And so, yeah, that makes it a very embodied practice and a very mindful practice which to me is um is through yoga yoga is about that connection with with ourselves so to bring that on the mat we need that presence and mindfulness so so yeah I'm very grateful to be uh to have been introduced to this practice and it's such a great tool to maintain a self-practice don't you think Yes, it is. I remember <laughs> Sana telling me, because I would always go to yoga class, and she's like, you need to sit on the mat and do self-practice. I'm like, it's the hardest. She's like, yes, but that's where the um, benefits happen. So that's true. <laughs> it's true. And then I, 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 I'm not going to say I do it every day, but I do try to do even a small self-practice um, throughout every, throughout at least a week, you know, and every day a little bit. Um, oh, and I'm going to borrow the book from Oshra. I'm going to tell her she's got the book here in the UK. <laughs> I left mine in Australia. So she's oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> the book, you know, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I'm gonna, I, she said I could borrow it. I'm, like, yeah, I'm going to oh, borrow it amazing. from Oshra. And, yeah, so I, I agree with you. Thank you so much for sharing that insight because, like, you've done Ashtanga. You've done – you've studied so many styles – and practice so many styles. So I was so curious why you love the Vijnana. And having learnt from you as well, I remember you saying, um, like, even feeling through the transitions is not necessarily like, oh, stick your arms out straight. You know, it just it's what flows. happens on the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like every single movement is also practice. And yeah. feeling the air against your fingertips like pushing that and it's like that energy you know you're feeling the energy in, in the air exactly so i yeah. remember you saying that and i thought oh wow i never looked at yoga that way until i learned from you i looked at yoga like okay my alignment this arm here that now i'm in the pose but that's not <laughs> like flowing like it's almost like a tai chi yoga i felt you know yeah. flowing yeah. in and out of poses and it's like a moving meditation it is, yeah, it is so beautiful to have this, um, this awareness of, of everything. And I love that you mentioned self-practice because um, you're right, uh, as yoga teachers, right, we should have a self-practice. It's too easy to like, give the responsibility to another teacher to guide us. It's kind of yeah. taking our hands off. It's like, yeah, do it for me. I'll just follow the movement. Yes. But yeah. the complete awareness and, and the learning really comes from being alone on our mats. Um, so, so to me, for any yoga practitioner, I think the goal on the long term should be to, to establish a self-practice at home. And the Aurit Sen Gupta is like, every day is a good way to start. Because she gives you a, a template here. Yeah. Monday morning, Monday evening, right? Exactly. And, then, and it changes all the time. So it doesn't get boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, I feel like you can also do another day if you feel like that may suit you better. Because, exactly. You know, it, it, what is the days were just created um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but it doesn't matter. It's when you need to tap into that energy, that sensation you're trying to get, you do that yeah. practice. Exactly. Thank you for explaining that as well that way. It's such well articulated for people who didn't know that yoga is not just doing the pose, we're achieving a sensation and a, there's a purpose for every posture. And, um, okay, this is a bit off topic again, but I know <laughs> not many people know, but you were a director and a bouncer at a nightclub, which is so cool. <laughs> I've had many lives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you look so young. <laughs> Have you achieved all this? <laughs> Must 
the only yoga you do <laughs> probably has to do with it yeah <laughs> and um I'm sure you've been exposed to any hostile situations in that environment with people drinking and under the influence and especially as a female in this position can you share any strategies in easing any hostile situations that you may encounter um yeah well I love this question um so in the situation that I was in, what I have to mention is that I was never alone, right? I would not be a, a single female managing the whole bar. Oh, cool. yeah. If there's a battle, I'm the one carrying people out. Yeah. I always had, <laughs> I always had the big, strong bouncers with me. But yeah. um, one of the things that um, was actually very useful was for me to be a female because it shocked people. And, and it has to do, you know, we were talking about uh, looking at the unconscious and subconscious and, and the way the brain works. So whenever we get into strong stress, it disconnects the empathy, the empathy part of our brain, right? So when people are a little drunk and they get triggered really, really easily and they get into uh, a fight, or even if we think when we are fighting with a loved one, right? We may love them to death, but during that fight, our only goal is to win. Why? Because our brain has switched off some parts that make us feel empathy. So in order to snap out of that, we need to interrupt that pattern. So as a female, if there was a, a, like a battle starting or something, I would just throw myself in the middle and say, hey, and, and then everyone would freeze because it was like <laughs> a pattern interrupt. And then I would have my big guys carrying people around, right? But that would, that would really limit the damage of, um, of having that pattern interrupt, of having people freezing, and then being much more prone to like, okay, yeah, I was maybe not fully myself, and, and, and walk out. Now, when we are in everyday life situation, I'm not saying that if we're in the middle of a battle, we need a pattern interrupt, but that's something to be aware of. Like when we have very, very strong emotional response to, um, to break that pattern with um, any type of stimuli, uh, that can be sound, that can be smells, uh, just something to distract the mind and snap out of this strong emotional response can be um, actually quite um quite powerful and the best tool is to take a deep breath <laughs> and <laughs> lengthen or exhale no but truly like when we take a deep breath and lengthen our exhale our parasympathetic system comes back online and and then we're more apt to respond appropriately in um in consideration of the way human interacts if i may say um, this is the, the new researchers or the new theories of, of, um, of how our brain, our, our brain function or our autonomic nervous system function. I don't know if you've heard of the polyvagal theory, for example. No, I haven't heard of that. Um, fascinating theory. Maybe we'll have wow. another call on that. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> but it's about love explaining to. that our stress response has yeah. different levels. Um, and some of this level is our fight or flight, but there's also the freeze that has a completely different physiological response and a different imprint than um, yeah, in the body. I've heard of it, but I didn't know it was called polyvariant response. So polyvagal. Po polyvagal yeah uh, so, flight fry, f fight freeze and, and fawn a uh, fawn and f fawn oh is that please fawn, fawn? Is, is that yeah please? yeah yeah it's I've pleasing that, which yeah. is a form of avoidance right when people have a very deep trauma and very often it, it when it relates to abuse um people will dissociate from the situation and some of that dissociation can come in the form of blacking out and having repressed memories or can come in the form of uh, falling, which will be um, trying to please to kind of dissociate from the, the situation. Which is that um, when those people develop feelings for their... Uh... It could be definitely part of it, which yeah. is also Do you know what I'm a survival. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I forgot the name it's, of it. It's a, yeah, something that syndrome. syndrome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Forget the name yeah. of it. Hostage, as well. where the, the hostages develop um, feelings for the 
<laughs> the people holding them captive. But yeah, that's the fawn response, isn't it? That could be a fawn response. Yeah. 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 And all of these are a protection mechanism, right? Our bodies are smart enough to respond the appropriate way to protect us against mm. a very dramatic situation that we may not be capable of handling at, at the moment. Um, so we shouldn't feel bad because we, um, we try to please someone in a situation that was very inappropriate and crossed their boundaries, unless it's a mm. pattern, right? Some, some of us mm. have patterns of behaviors, but sometimes it's like, why did I act this way? Well, maybe that's what we needed to do to survive in that moment and then move on from that and understand that it was just a normal response of the body. That's such a great um, point to be aware of how you respond in, ho in hostile situations so that you can, with that awareness, act appropriately. Yeah. I did and not you... expect our chat to go this way. <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't expect <laughs> <laughs> and this is another like random side topic, but, but having um, that deep practice for yourself and also teaching it, do you know, notice when you feel a block in any of your, a blockage of your body and you're like, I need to do this, this and this to, yeah. to get balanced, you notice it quicker now than you did before? Oh, immediately. Um, oh, okay. And, and not just in my practice, but I, I think in my everyday life, where um, the first thing I'll notice is my breath, right? I'll notice if my breath is restricted in, in any way and, and I'm even able to give it a meaning, right? Um, or notice um, felt sensation, whether I feel imbalanced, whether I feel heavy, whether I feel um, light. These are drops excited. of gold that you're telling right? us. How you <laughs> feel, like the breath the sensations that you're feeling no one teaches you that you know and that's we, the initial cue that's our body speaking I, I don't remember which one was my t teacher so i feel bad because i won't be able to credit her but one of my teachers said we, most people live 10 blocks away from their bodies right we have no clue what's happening within ourselves mm -hmm. because we're so busy looking outward at what we're doing, our responsibilities, social media, all the media stimulation that we have, that we have no freaking awareness of what's happening inside. And that's how we carry um, like precursor signs of disease and don't address them until they're full blown into chronic conditions. If we just took the time to like pay attention to how we feel. And I'm not saying like, getting into our emotions all the time but just like hey how's my body today like oh i'm feeling tense maybe it's time that i do a bit of movement or i go for a massage like oh i'm feeling heavy maybe i should dance and sing right so if we brought that balance immediately i believe we would be so healthy so much healthier that's amazing. I'm very You're passionate right? about that. <laughs> i can tell i can tell so you love the, the sensation and you pay attention to your breath you pay attention to how you, you feel in um, your emotions. Any other cues that you notice um, within yourself? Well, my breathwork teacher, Edward Dangerfield, um, introduced to me something really interesting, um, which comes from uh, the natives in Canada, which is the four directions, right? Checking in in the four di direction, which is physically emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And that became part of almost my daily morning routine that would wake up and without even thinking, like addressing all those four ones, like, oh, how do I feel mentally? How do I feel? And, and that doesn't mean that I have to fix it. It's just like becoming aware of it. That, oh, today I feel um, mentally very exhausted. Well, maybe it's not the day to study and or launch a new project, right? Maybe it's more of a day to get on my mat. That, that awareness is, is very powerful. And do you ever um, tap into the, I don't know if the energy of the universe, ha have you heard of that, that each day has brings different energy and you can tap into that to, to use <laughs> it more to per enhance your, your purpose? Um, that gets a little 
out there for me for my own like for my understanding of the world and i know that some people are very in tune with that um this is not something i've looked into however i'm very in tune with how the seasons the temperature um the moon cycles will affect um our bodies our energies even our, our hormones and 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 when we talk moon cycles, like in, in yoga, there's a lot of stuff about moon cycles and it seems very woo but every living thing is impacted by the moon, right? The, um, the agricultures will yeah. know specific harvesting time based on the moon will give better fruits, sweeter fruits, will... Uh, certain herbs are picked on specific moon cycles because they will be a lot more potent if they're picked, for example, during a full moon. So, so we are affected by by these things. It's, it's very silly to think that we're we're an island and we're not affected by everything that surrounds us. But to say that I tap into the energy of the universe, um, probably not. To me, it's more of an awareness of how my environment impacts me and and also how I impact my environment. That makes sense. Thank you for sharing. And um, what advice would you give someone who's like brand new to the yoga practice? Um, Just do it. (laughs) (laughs) That's so simple. Um, That is so simple, right? How do I start yoga? Get on your mat and start moving. Just move. Um, (laughs) Move your body. <laughs> no, I, like more seriously, which um, yeah. I think the best advice I can give someone is to not take it too seriously. Mm. Um, yoga is a serious practice because it is, after all, a spiritual practice. But if we become too serious about it and too judgmental about it, it, it won't last. I, mm. I firmly believe that we should keep some lightness in our daily practice. We should... Um, have fun with it, be curious and explore. And, and that's why I recommend to someone who's new to, to explore, to, to see what works for you, what doesn't, to um, maybe make <clears throat> notes or mental note of how you feel after yoga class, right? Because yeah. there are some very concrete impacts. And if we become aware of these impacts, we're a lot more likely to keep showing up on our minds. Yeah, that's Great advice, great advice. And I know, especially now these days, a lot of people may feel you know, depressed um, if they're in lockdown. I know Australia right now is in lockdown. And is there any yoga postures or practices that you can recommend to help reduce that depression state of mind, a depressed state of mind? Um, there is. Um, now, I would like to say, like, if we feel... A little down rather than than depressed depression is a condition and i don't want to start encouraging people to self-diagnose uh, but when we feel down and the last year has been very blue prone to that they are very yeah. blue um so there's these feelings of having heaviness and stagnancy so it's good to bring some energizing practices and energizing practices will be your heart openers. And I think heart openers are so prescribed um, during these, these times to energize, Mm. but also to, to remind yourself of a connection with others. Um, So heart openers, um, inversions within your practice. Don't start doing headstand if you (laughs) haven't done headstand before. Just put your legs up the wall and chill. (laughs) Exactly, (laughs) legs up the wall or even downward facing dog is an inversion. Um, Our shoulder stand is my favorite. Um, Arm balances, again, if that's in your practice. Um, Surya Namaskar, Either 27, 54, or 108 Surya Namaskar, again, wow. depending on, on your level of practice. It's a really beautiful active meditation. It helps to count, calm the anxious mind and bring a bit of activation if we feel blue or, or low energy. And it's very empowering to do 108 sun salutation. Wow. I, did a, I think I've done that once. 
Yeah, and I agree. It is very empowering. I didn't do so many with Asha. I caught up with her recently. We just did like maybe 10 or 15, but still I felt the immediate shift in the mind, especially yeah. doing it outside on grass, grounding down, next level feeling. Absolutely. Well, connection with nature is so powerful. And now the northern, northern hemisphere is coming into spring and summer. So get outside, right? Even if yeah. we cannot meet uh, with groups of people, just connect with nature, what, walking barefoot in the grass, watching the birds in the trees. All of these remind us of our interconnectedness and, and this great mood boosters. Such great advice. So guys, energizing practices, inversions, heart openers, arm balances, Surya Namaskars, getting out in nature. Those are great um, pieces to take away if you're feeling blue or in lockdown, mm. you need to get out of the funk. <laughs> and uh, I know your true desire is learning. That's why you have so much wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> and how do you tame your ever so curious mind from overtaking other areas of your life? This is a question because I also have a curious mind and I always find myself learning to the point where I don't want to do anything except continue my, my learning. And then I feel like <laughs> I'm not living because I'm learning all the time. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, how do you that do is it? true. <laughs> yeah. Um, the way I've managed that, for me, work has always been a priority. So even during my corporate career, I was uh, always studying. I studied psychology while I was in, um, in human resources. Um, right now, <clears throat> obviously, school takes a little more space than, than before because it's a former program. And, and still, like, I look at new programs and I want to register to everything. everything. <laughs> At one point, I, I need to prioritize what brings to um, what brings the most to to my goals, right? So yeah. for now, I have specific career objective, the way I want to show up for my students. So I'm going to prioritize what will add to that. You you know right. that one of my dream is to do a PhD in quantum physics, right? Yes, that's going to come later because it's not necessarily going to make me a better. Um, yoga teacher or osteopath or breathwork practitioner. So, so I'm okay to pause it because I have more time ahead of me. I know that it's a lifelong process um, of learning. So, so yeah, I really focus on, on how I want to show up and, and what will bring the most value. And, and right now, information is so accessible and knowing myself, I know that if I registered so many things, I, I won't finish them. And it's going to be a waste of time and a waste of money. So I've learned a hard way. <laughs> Paying okay. for courses that I never finished. Thanks for and, sharing. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think we all do. And I'm a yeah. big fan of online learning. But that's one of the downsides of online learning is that uh, it's harder to actually follow through and complete courses when you don't have that day-to-day -day accountability. So, um, so yeah, knowing yourself, knowing where we want to go, um, I think helps a lot. And, and, and I don't really have like this FOMO anymore. Um, like, oh yeah. If, if you're missing out for those. Yeah. Know FOMO. <laughs> like, if there is a yeah. course now that I know I don't really have the time to do, I know that either is going to be offered later or a better version will come eventually, right? Knowledge yeah. is something that is um, constantly evolving. And, and the more the years pass, the more techniques, the more uh, research. So, so yeah, no problem waiting because it's going to be even better later. <laughs> nice. I'm going to think like that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll postpone whatever course I'm going to do next <laughs> when it's evolved and it suits me. <laughs> there we go. I, I mean, I wanted to, um, I wanted to do a master in psychology. Um, when was that? That was 10 years ago, right? At the time, online education was not there. So the only programs that were available online were not suited for me. So I put that project on hold. Uh, I was lucky enough that a Silvati one school had a format that was convenient for me. So, so yeah, I, I think that there's going to be a good time for, for everything. 
Oh, oh, look who's I online. Know, Kyle. <laughs> Hi, Kaya. We were just Hi, talking Kaya. about you earlier and how wonderful you are. <laughs> yes, and we love the training. <laughs> I love being on the training. And yes, that's so amazing that you came. <laughs> and um, thank you for sharing that. That is amazing how you control that um, eagerness to learn and grow. And um, my next question is, what is the most common myth about yoga that you would like to debunk? Oh. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, to me, I think the biggest myth about yoga, or the biggest misconception about yoga is that yeah. yoga is a physical practice or it's a, a sport, right? Yeah. Um, Yoga is a spiritual practice first and foremost, and the movement is a way to connect to that type of spirituality. And I know that can be really scary to hear that, that yoga is a spiritual practice. And we need to understand that spirituality is not religion. Spirituality is just a way to connect with whatever our definition of the divine is. To me, the divine is that's something special within myself and within everything else that exists, right? I don't have a, a God version of, of the divine. To me, it's more of that unseen force that, that is permanent. Um, unfortunately, in our modern days, yoga is very trendy, right? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Kaya. Bye, Kaya. The awesome secret is Vijnana yoga practice. <laughs> Your style. <laughs> it is. Kenya, you'll have to watch the replay. We spoke about Vishnana and your teachings for, yes. for like 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yoga is very trendy, right? So we plug the word yoga on, on everything, on teas, on, um, on whatever form of movement, on, uh, on clothing, on, on whatever. Everything is yoga now. Days and, and the interpretation, the kind of mainstream interpretation of that is yoga is movement. Um, yoga is not just movement. Movement is a means to an end um, in yoga. And uh, it doesn't have to be a spiritual practice of singing Om. To me, it's just about a practice of mindfulness and presence with yourself. That makes, to me, that spirituality. It doesn't have to be prayer. It doesn't have to be chanting. Um, but movement with intention and presence is, is a spiritual practice. So, yeah, I hope that more and more people will realize that it's not just moving and doing downward facing dog. <laughs> yes, I love that. Movement with inten intention and presence, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And I also love that you, um, your explanation of OM in one of your um, on your post, on your page. I think I shared it as well, guys, if you're listening. Fantastic breakdown of how OM um, it can be used as a part, as a door to connect to the divine, to tap into that, that gateway. It's a gateway to tapping into that divine, whatever you may think it is. So I love exactly. your... Exactly, yeah. I love it, that vibration. Yeah. And I think it's important that we understand what we do, Right why do we sing om why do we yeah. sing mantras what do the mantras mean so that um we also became become critical of what we do and again that idea of empowerment right so that we're not entering any form of dogmatism of following a guru mindlessly to me it's very important to know why we're doing what we're doing and and to not be afraid of asking questions to our teachers that's so great and i think also like try it for yourself like try it and see if it works and i love your breakdown and, and for those who will say, say i used to say om and then you said it was a u m as well you told me in the training um, which is yeah. um, <laughs> it creates a different vibration right? it really does om versus aum it definitely does you yeah say it right guys om is very much here right well yeah. om will rise from the roots up um and again, that, that taps into um, like more of the woo-woo stuff of the different frequency, but or organs or cells have different frequencies. So through that aum, we, we have that frequency rising. Um, yeah. It's really beautiful. 
But guys, please listen to that video. I'll share it again because I thought it was awesome. Because don't don't disregard the power of the al om <laughs> until you do, say it the right way. <laughs> um, and the next question is: um, You mentioned like taking action. You attribute that to your successes so far. Can you name another characteristic that you attribute to your success? Hmm. about that um passion i think to me like it's mm. passion is what fuels taking action but whatever i do i'm really passionate about so mm. that means that i put my heart into it which makes failure not being an option right and i accept mm. that things will fail but uh, when you're so passionate about something and you put your heart into it when they fail you keep working at it until uh, until they work. So, so yeah, I think because I've always had jobs or companies that I'm very passionate about, that I see purpose uh, into, um, it really fueled my desire to push through and make it work and, and give it my best. That's amazing. You can tell you're so passionate. I love it. And... Um... Okay, this, what do you think is the meaning of life? <laughs> oh, this is deep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really love the yoga meaning of life, the yoga meaning of existence. Um, I truly and deeply and honestly connect to it. And according to... To yoga, the meaning of existence is to come back to our true self, right? So we are born pure and we go through experiences and we carry um, what yoga would call samskaras uh, and and karma, what our modern life could call um, acquired and and kind of forced belief and, and trauma and patterns of behaviors. And and I think the meaning of life is to actually find what lies behind all of these patterns of behaviors. And and when we go back to being our truest essence, then we connect to the divine spark between us, between us, within us, sorry. It's, yeah, it's a very, yeah. very deep. <laughs> yeah, it was a very deep question. I know. That's why I'm so it. curious. Yeah, with your reading and your <laughs> life experience. I'm like, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> and I um, mean, that's we can th- spend yeah. all of our. No, go ahead. I was going to say, like that quote from the Bhagavad Gita you know, yoga is a journey from the self through the self to the self. Like what you said reminded me of that. Yeah. So coming back to the true self. That's true. One full circle. <laughs> yeah, we're coming back. Yeah. What did you coming say? Coming back sorry? to who we really are. Yeah. And sorry, I think my connection is a bit unstable right now. So yeah, coming back to, to what we, we really are. And it might seem selfish. Um, others may think that the goal of existence is to help others and um, but yeah, I think that the more attentive we are, the more we can serve other people. That's such that a beautiful. Sense. That makes perfect sense. The more authentic you are, the more you can serve. It really does. Um, I love that. And the last question is: What about quantum physics do you find so interesting that you want to study it deeper? I know you touched upon it briefly before, <laughs> but you were saying you want to do a master's in quantum physics. Is that right? Or a PhD? I'd like to have a PhD, a PhD. in quantum just, physics. Um, yeah, P- so many letters. But we'll see. You know about <laughs> <laughs> Why not go through it? We'll yeah. see. To me, that's like a very long-term project. It's kind yeah. of my bucket list item. That's the only item on my, um, on my bucket list, actually. Um, why? The first reason is an ego reason. Um, and it's because I don't understand it. And it frustrates me that I don't understand um, the, the fundamental um, aspects of quantum physics. So 
first and foremost is from that frustration. I want to know something that I don't understand. Second is that to me, quantum physics could be the answer um, or the missing link between science and spirituality um, because it acknowledges the the influence of the mind, the influence of the observer. Um, and these are very, very hard to conceive. And, and that's why we get into spirituality and religion to explain them. But what if science can, can bring that? So for me, it's that curiosity of bridging science and spirituality through, um, yeah, through potentially quantum physics. This is going to be a journey. I'm not ready for it yet. <laughs> wow. I can't wait to interview again once you've started this bucket list item <laughs> of yours. <laughs> and I'm just going through to see um, any more questions. Um, someone said, uh, share some tips to connect nature through yoga and meditation. I guess practice in nature. Uh, what would you say? Practice share in nature is... Um, the yeah um and someone else wrote how vinyasa practice enhances the transcendental level Ooh, i wouldn't know how to answer oh that. that's it i love that to I me leave that to you vinyasa, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah no i love it to me vinyasa yeah. is um i i, I mean the, the type of vinyasa that i teach i aim to provide a moving meditation not just a a sequence but truly a moving meditation to me that's what vinyasa should be so by creating these sequences we take the mind out and um and bring the full awareness into the movement and the breath and create mm -hmm. a a rhythm right when we get into these rhythmic bilateral movements we mm -hmm. tap into the subconscious and unconscious mind which is super interesting mm -hmm. um so so yeah vinyasa can be a gate to deeper states of consciousness if we practice it with presence and uh awareness once again right if we practice it as aesthetic place your foot like this put your arms like that again yeah. we're in the in the doing right if we mm. move from doing to being then we I, I think it can really be a gateway to um to deep states of meditation and potentially altered consciousness wow yeah well said and i do get that feeling when i do a vinyasa class that you literally just follow well i practice with without my glasses so i can't also see and i pachihara would draw the senses and it becomes like mm. you do transcend the physical plane because you're not thinking well i'm not thinking I'm, the mind chatter is gone i'm just moving and it does become like a transcendental well in my experience anyway <laughs> Experience. No, it's a, it's a very valid sense experience. Yeah. And yeah. I think that this is beautiful, this thing of removing the glasses. Yeah. I don't want to get laser surgery. and fully be present. Yeah. I don't want to get, you know, people are like, why don't you get laser <laughs> surgery? Really I'm like, reason. Uh, no, Pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses. That is, <laughs> that is gifted to me with my short sightedness. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, why would I want to correct my so gift? <laughs> Why would I want to correct my gift with the laser surgery? I don't want to see everyone else who's practicing next to me. I want to stick to my mat. This short sighted is a reminder. Come to myself, right? This is so, amazing. I love yeah. that so much. Yeah. And so I, I actually do enjoy um, having um, the ability to take my glasses off and on when I want to. I noticed a difference. Someone yeah. told me a lot of no, our, that's good. A lot of our energy is wasted through our eyes. Have you heard, heard like a lot of our that's true. Uh, Yeah. So by not being able to absorb all that, and that's why people use so much advertising and marketing, they have so much emphasis on that. You know, because they know what we see goes straight into it. It's the shortest path. The optic nerve is the shortest path from your uh, from the outside world to the brain. So people prey on that. So I'm like, I don't want to see all that, that advertisements. I'm gonna take my glasses off. <laughs> I get into my mind. <laughs> um, hmm. Now it's brilliant to have the choice, and you know, 
for yeah. sorry for people who don't wear glasses then we can actively just decide not to pay attention it's a bit more challenging because it's an effort but it's still yeah. available uh, to not pay attention and not become distracted by that intense simulation and another question was how many times yoga nidra can perform by person in a day hmm You know, at per se, there is no contraindication to yoga nidra. Yeah. Um, I would not practice it with any signs of depression or, or low mood necessarily. Um, but um, to me, I would think once a day is enough to yeah. practice yoga nidra because if practiced properly, it should not affect your sleep cycle. I've never experienced myself practicing yoga at Nidra more than once a day, but I would suspect that it could potentially affect our sleep at night, right? And then it affects our circadian rhythm. I would mm. recommend once a day and mm. ideally practicing it um, mid-afternoon to late afternoon is, um, is a good time to practice it. Mm. Great advice. And the last question someone wrote is share some info about Patanjali's yoga sutras related with contemporary yoga. I found that interesting because I feel like Sorry, con- oh yeah the question was share some information about Patanjali's yoga sutras related with contemporary yoga. I find that with con- what contemporary mm. I mean like modern yoga a lot of the philosophy is like lost, you know, it's not communicated. So um with every class no one cites recites any philosophical from any of the yogic philosophers there's so many other than just patanjali but he's the most famous one right um so mm-hmm. um what would you say on that um that question um, so to me the entire book of the yoga sutra is so relevant to the way we live our life right so not necessarily on the mat but outside of the mat but whatever happens outside of the mat can also be mirrored on the mat if we push through and are like uh, overachiever in life we're going to have the exact same behavior in life so to me mm-hmm. the way the sutras can help us or yoga philosophy in general is that we can practice skills or behaviors or patterns on the mat that we can then bring um, into our life. And the mat allows us to see ourselves for, for who we are while in our everyday life we are so distracted. So to have that opportunity to become the observer of, oh, what happens when I'm uncomfortable in a posture? Or what happens uh, when a harder option is offered to me? What happens when I face pain? What happens when I face stillness, right? All of these are observations that we can have. And trust me, what we do on the mat, we do in our life. Um, Also, I want to mention that Uh, bringing yoga philosophy in yoga classes is not just reciting um, the sutras or reciting the Bhagavad Gita. I think that um, might be super intimidating to bring these big concepts um, onto the mat, but it doesn't mean that we can ta- talk uh, about truthfulness, for example, right, which is one of the, the yamas, or that we cannot talk about um opposite emotion or that we cannot talk about steadiness and comfort which is the sutra on so without having to like shove philosophy into people's mouth i think that the lessons that we learn from the yoga sutra can very very easily be integrated and it's up to the teachers a lot of teachers are quite afraid to bring yoga philosophy in their classes they're afraid that it might be either um, misperceived or rejected. Um, I think that on the contrary, if we bring it with a lot of respect and using examples that talk to people that they can connect to, then it becomes a really, really nice way to have a deep impact on on people's life. And that can be as simple as like watch the way you're, your mind is talking to you right now and would you talk to someone else the way you're talking to yourself right 
mm. huge lesson. Most of yeah. us have this mind chatter that is so negative about ourselves, but we would never talk about anyone else this way. Yeah. That is su such well, such a great example. Just observe your own thoughts and talk to yourself like your best friend. <laughs> and to me, good. that's yoga philosophy, right? Yeah. Because that's what yoga philosophy is. It's about understanding the mind. Yeah. And um, there's so many. <laughs> Can you see the last two questions? Someone has written. If you have time, do you have time, Marilyn? Um, um, uh, I, I do, I do. You do? People, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, Yes, please. I, I can read it. So someone's written, people have belief in science and technology, but they don't have the same beliefs in yogic science. Um, why is that? Um, <clears throat> I think there is a stigma on spiritual practices that it's woo. Mm -hmm. um, and and for that, because we don't understand it, it's easier to reject it. It's easy to, um, to push away something that, that we don't understand. And part of that comes from, um, I think, the way that we bring these concepts to people, right? If I show up with my MC Hammer pants wearing tons of mandalas and smelling like patchouli, in a corporate yoga class, they're not going to welcome me, right? They're going to think that I'm weird. So I think we need to talk to people where they are. And, and to me, I like being very grounded. That's my, that's my approach. And I see myself as the teacher who introduces students to yoga philosophy to make them ready to then go and study with gurus in, in India. This is not my role. Um, because my level of understanding is, or, or my passion is to make it very relatable into like our daily corporate Western, um, Western life. So I think knowing our audience is important and based on, you were talking about marketing, right? Well, mm. philosophy should be marketed as well. And, and marketing simply means talking to your audience, talking in terms that they understand. We can talk about the exact same thing using different words that people will relate to. And then they have that aha moment, and then they want to know more. And then they go study further with people that are more competent um, than me, I, I believe, right? My passion is to plant that seed by yeah. examples that they can relate to yeah wow amazing i Thank hope that so answers uh, i hope that answers your question <laughs> yeah i think that's a good answer and i will say agree that like like what you said um it's the stigma associated with yoga and when you really look at yoga i think i think it is a science right it may not uh be quantified but for it to have lasted so many years um, it's a testament to its benefits, right? And I don't need a scientific well, evidence fact, to show you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In India, actually, um, yoga is considered a science, and there is four main science. There's um, the Vedic astrology, which is mm -hmm. not the, the horoscope that we have, it's a different one. Yeah, um, yoga, so um, Ayurveda, and Vastu Shastra, right? So these are the four traditional sciences uh, that we have in India. Yeah. And um, that is such a, so much information to, to deeply delve into. And it's such a serious topic of study. Like <laughs> studying the Vedas, people dedicate like 12 years of their life. It's a serious study. Um, and something I'm very... It is. Um, my next... Um, a uh, guest on, on this show is a Vedic philosopher, um, Ram Vakalakala. So if you stay tuned for future, it will be great. to I'll be picking his mind on some of his um, Amazing. <laughs> Vedic knowledge <laughs> from studying the Vedas. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, Marilyn, thank you so much for your time and showing up again and sharing this uh, wealth of wisdom embedded with your life experience i think you articulate it so beautifully and you can tell um you're very passionate about the subjects and i'm such an honor to have you here with me 
Um, can you please tell the audience more about uh, what you can offer, what you do, your social media, and how people can contact you? Sure. So at, um, at the moment, uh, we are running a fantastic online yoga teacher training. And I know that online may sound scary. Um, I've worked online and studied online for the past two decades. Uh, so when we launched the program, it was with the awareness of the extra support that it requires. And in fact, it's a bit like doing a private uh, yoga teacher training where Ella and myself are with our students at every step. Um, which is really beautiful. So um, this training can be found at zazyoga.com or online training.zazyoga.com. For people who have already done a yoga teacher training, we also offer a bridge program for yoga teachers. Um, a lot of people, 70% of people graduating from a yoga teacher training don't feel confident enough to teach. So uh, the bridge training gaps that... Um, gaps their knowledge um, brings them the approach of functional anatomy in the practice of mindfulness in the practice um, so it's been a very successful program as well and we also have a um, a shorter course open to everyone which is journey to the through the chakras if you're interested to learn more about energy anatomy and the chakra system with beautiful practices from um, from Ella. So all of these are available on zazyoga.com. Also on Instagram at zazyoga. I love to receive questions uh, and, and chat uh, with my followers. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to message me. It's one of the best way to contact me. That's fantastic. And I really appreciate you for being my, for meeting you, being my teacher um at uh my yoga teacher training but also after you know i feel like uh, i'm really grateful for the connection and even you coming on here after years after um my yoga teacher training and sharing your insights means a lot i'm infinitely grateful we connect <laughs> and so guys if you have any questions please um contact uh, Marilyn on zazyoga.com please follow Zaz Yoga and yoga teacher training Bali um, I can vouch for it I can say it's very very um, a top-notch educators and um, yeah I really 100% um, would support and guide anyone to that portal for uh, to, to yoga um, and thank you so much, Marilyn. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having <laughs> me. So thank much. you for your challenging and, and fun questions. And oh. for anyone, if you want to keep the discussion going, please contact me um, via Instagram, via direct messages. I need. I saw there was a few more questions. We didn't have time to answer. Time, so I'll yeah. be happy to, uh, to continue the discussion offline. Wonderful. Thank you, Marilyn. And guys, stay tuned for our next interview on your girl underscore Ratika. Until then, take care. And bye, Marilyn. Bye.